Hi. Today, I'd like to talk about the mismatch between the security and privacy tools that we design and kids in the K through 12 classroom. If you're concerned about your safety online, you know it's a struggle out there. It's even tougher for kids who are exposed to computers earlier and more frequently than ever. As adults, we may be frustrated by the permission prompts, privacy policies, and passwords that are intended to keep us safe. But for kids, these tools don't make sense. And they're also tough for the teachers, administrators, and software companies that are trying to help kids access technology in school. I've been thinking about student data privacy and security for the past three years as a member of the engineering team at Clever. Clever is an identity platform and single sign-on portal that's used in over half of the K through 12 classrooms in the United States. I came to Clever because I believe that technology can improve education, and a better, educa uh, better educated, educated society means better outcomes for everybody. As someone who cares about people's right to online safety, I know that if we give children access to technology in the classroom, it needs to be safe. That's where all of us come in. We need to understand how children use technology in the classroom to build effective security and privacy mechanisms for them. And I'd like to talk about what I've learned for the past three years. First, I'm gonna talk about the risks of what's happening right now, the security and privacy threat model for education technology. Next, I'll talk about prompts, policies, and passwords, things that are difficult for adults that are huge challenges for kids. Next, I'll talk about what I see that's working, and after that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. If you're a kid in school, people want access to your educational data for a variety of reasons. The Department of Education recently warned that hackers are targeting elementary and high schools. They attempt to extort money from school districts by holding student data for ransom. Researchers at Fordham look for and found student data brokers selling personal information about students, including their uh, ethnicity, affluence, religion, and lifestyle. These lists are used for everything from college recruiting to targeting advertising for family planning services, as we can see in this transcript of a voicemail that the researchers received from a data broker. As adults, we're concerned about cyber criminals targeting our identity for theft, corporations targeting our personal information for profit, and governments targeting our businesses Kids face a different set of concerns, like cyberbullying, abuse, educational data mining, and algorithmic discrimination. But we give them our adult defenses. Those of us who build security and privacy mechanisms should be able to empathize with kids, since we all used to be one. But even software designed for children inherits the security and privacy problems of the one-size-fits-all internet. We know this, so we restrict kids' access to technology, but if we're overly restrictive, kids don't get the benefits of technology. And this is especially important if you believe in the potential for technology to improve educational outcomes. You may remember the early days of educational software and titles like Oregon Trail, Number Munchers, and Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? In today's US K through 12 classroom, kids have access to hundreds of different software services. 
Some are designed specifically for the classroom, like IXL math or vocabulary. Others have crossover appeal, like Khan Academy or Duolingo or Google Docs. Kids use Chromebooks, iPads, and Windows devices that are either given to them directly or shared with other students or brought from home. Curriculum departments evaluate software to deploy across entire districts with the goal of personalizing the learning process, improving assessment scores, and ultimately changing people's lives for the better. Research has shown that students using computers have improved motivation, problem solving abilities, and assessment scores. And we spend a lot of money on education technology, $27 billion in 2017 alone. But if you step into the classroom and you look at the data, it's not clear that it's working. There are many barriers to deploying education technology in the classroom, like broken screens or inadequate training on usage. One of the very persistent barriers that technology brings with it is a legacy of security and privacy problems. And when you're talking to a concerned parent, the bar for the acceptable risk of a new technology is very high. When security and privacy don't work in the classroom, we end up with two outcomes that we don't want. One, if children lose control of their data before they can possibly be expected to understand the consequences, that's bad. But it's also bad if they're stuck and they don't get access to the beneficial aspects of technology, the educational potential. I'd like to talk about three non-kid-friendly security and privacy mechanisms, and then I'll talk a little bit about the work that's happening that I think can make things better. The prefrontal cortex is a part of the brain implicated in complex decision-making, planning, and social interaction. It's not fully developed until around the age of 25. That's why kids don't vote or decide what they eat for dinner or even decide if they can go on a field trip. Adults act as surrogate decision makers for kids, especially when it comes to safety decisions. In the school context, school officials make safety decisions for kids. And this should include decisions about how they share their data. But it often doesn't, because the tools we give them don't support it. Think about how you share data online. Many of the interactions aren't designed to deal with this idea of surrogate decision making. And this is an ethical problem not only for students in schools, but also for adults incapable medically of making decisions. If you're a student in school, who should even get to decide where your data goes? Is it your teacher or your principal? Maybe the curriculum department. What about your parents? Do they get a say? Or maybe software companies should decide. Ultimately, each of these people need to agree, and showing permission prompts to students doesn't help that. Researchers, research suggests that permission prompts don't even help keep us safe. When we encounter permission prompts frequently, we become habituated to them, where we ignore them because we have a finite amount of attention. When we show permission prompts to kids, they're not only exposed to the habituation effect, but they also get confused. And if you read the App Store reviews from kids, or if you field support tickets from teachers, you learn that these permission prompts are barriers to using software in the classroom, eating away at limited instructional time. Another prompt that leads to the habituation effects in adults are TLS warnings. Often they're just configuration errors, not real attacks. In the school environment, they're especially prevalent because internet content filtering is required by the Children's Internet Protection Act. These filters are often architected as middleware boxes with root certificates installed on every student's device, but they're often misconfigured so that students go to visit websites and the certificate isn't recognized and they encounter a TLS error that they learn at a very early age to ignore. 
Another prompt that adults and students struggle with is built into the weight-bearing protocol for identity on the web, OAuth. In the OAuth flows, the person making the decision about whether to share the data is the same person that the data is about. This doesn't make sense for students when adults have already decided for them to share this data. As platforms become more integrated and tightly controlled, we as designers lose the flexibility to modify these default behaviors. Prompts don't work well for the fully formed prefrontal cortexes that they were designed for. They don't work at all for kids when they put the responsibility on the end user to make complicated safety decisions. They probably still work better than privacy policies, which work for almost no one. We've known this since the early 2000s when USA Today published an article that said that the, uh, the top 10 sites' privacy policies were all written at a college level or higher, whereas the average reading level is at a grade 10. There's an obvious mismatch between the information that we give people to make decisions and the information that they actually use to make those decisions. I don't think it's even moderately surprising that privacy policies can't be expected to help kids. Our elected legislators seem to agree, and 121 state student privacy laws have been passed since 2013. These laws, like privacy policies, attempt to set obligations for companies that handle student data. But are they effective? Let's take a look at a federal law, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. COPPA regulates how companies can collect and process personal information from children under the age of 13. Researchers at the Berkeley Laboratory for Usable and Experimental Security built a static analysis tool to look at Android applications and determine if they were sending personal information to third-party services. They ran this tool on over 5,000 applications from the Google Play Store's Designed for Families program, which must be COPPA compliant. They found that 73% of these apps transmitted personal data to third-party services in apparent violation of COPPA. Here are some examples of the data they found being sent. The reason this was so common, third-party SDKs that are designed for analytics and advertising, not children and COPPA. Even if companies want to follow every letter of the law, it's still very, very difficult for them to do so. A recently enacted California student data privacy law, the Student Online Personal Information Protection Act, mandates that companies that handle student data must maintain reasonable security procedures. The translation of this confusing standard into day-to-day -day engineering decision-making means that at least some companies are going to have data breaches, and sure enough, they have. Designing secure systems for children is just as tricky as designing systems that respect their privacy. And passwords, like prompts and policies, are designed about assumptions for adults that don't make sense for kids. If you're a young kid, entering even a simple password takes a long time. Schools don't even attempt to have complicated passwords for young students. But even complicated passwords aren't that secure, which is why we have two-factor. But two-factor systems that rely on you having a phone don't make sense for kids who don't have phones or aren't allowed to use their phone in the classroom. Imagine you're a teacher, and you've somehow successfully been able to hand out a cart full of shared tablets to your students, and they're signed in and on task. And then at the end of class, they hand back in the tablets, and you have to go through each one to make sure that they've logged out. Otherwise, the next student in the class will get their data. The security and privacy tools we build don't always work in classrooms. So what do we need to know to design for the classroom context? We should design for misuse, because kids are chaotic and resist control. 
we've seen DOS attacks that originate from the classroom. We went to teach coding at a local middle school, and some students felt like hackers when they were able to modify a web page in the browser inspector, but others crowded around a student who found a web page where you could fire a virtual machine gun at Justin Bieber's face. Keeping control over classrooms means giving control to teachers. Teachers hand out passwords on the first day of school to students. They help students who can't log in. They answer questions and provide support. They're the glue that holds the classroom together and their role needs to be baked into the security and privacy tools that we give kids. District administrators tackle huge security and privacy challenges with limited budget and support. Fortunately, there's some great work going on in the ed tech and privacy communities that's trying to help make sure what we have is safe. At the Symposium for Usable Privacy and Security last year, there was a workshop around designing security and privacy tools for children and teenagers. They reviewed a mobile monitoring application with a group of children, redesigning some features the children thought parents shouldn't be able to control. They sketched out a system for safely responding to messages from strangers on youth-focused social media. They show that it's possible to guide children towards safety by cooperatively designing technology. At Clever, I've helped build a single sign-on portal for the classroom, and one of the problems we noticed was that young students have trouble entering passwords, and it takes up a lot of time. So we built a system where schools can print out badges with QR codes on them that students can hold up to webcams in order to sign in. I'd like to show a video that brings in some of the voices around who this talk centers, the teachers and students who use the technology we build. Topic, and they're just really eager to learn. I usually log them in with their username and password. This is very hard for them because they don't know their letters and they don't know their numbers. How do I expect for them to log in? And, and, and typing in their username and password can take between a minute to five minutes, just depending on the student. When they logged in using their username and password, they weren't really excited about it. Now I feel like I've seen right away that they're so eager and excited to even log in to use their online learning programs. I really want them to enjoy school and think of it as a positive. When we design for children, we design for a range of awareness, capability, and autonomy. And similarly, when we design security and privacy tools, we shouldn't make things one size fits all. If you work on a browser or an operating system or any piece of software that might impact children, I encourage you to think about their unique threat model. EdTech can change the world, but first it needs to be both safe and useful. Kids face security and privacy challenges in the classroom, and to help solve them, we need to understand how our technology impacts them. Thanks.